2010, and I'm interviewing Gordon Hanna. <laughs> okay, so my first question was, where were you born? Here. In Hartford? Right, right oh, really? Here, oh, <laughs> all right. How was it growing up in Hartford? It's been very nice. I mean, oh. we've lived here all our lives. I have, and uh, my parents lived here, my grandparents lived here at this mm -hmm. point. And I lived down the road. It was very nice. We uh, always enjoyed the countryside around here. and It's semi-rural. Yeah. You said that you were a farmer when you were a kid with your parents? No, I worked on a farm. You worked on a farm. I okay. started working on a farm when I was 11. Oh, really? Okay. There was a big farm down the road. Mm -hmm. It was a Clifford Sheldon farm. About a 300-acre farm. And uh, <clears throat> I started working for him when I was 11 years old, nights after school and mm -hmm. Saturdays and Sundays. Were your parents farmers or? My parents uh, lived down the road. My father, my uncle, mm -hmm. and my grandfather owned Hannah Hardware mm -hmm. up, up in Hartford up here, one mile up. Yeah, I saw, I saw that building. Okay. Yep. Um, was it difficult for you to balance both school and working on a farm? No, it wasn't that bad mm -hmm. because you got out early, or you got out about 3 o'clock, and you didn't work until dark, uh -huh. but uh, and I worked Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. I did all the plowing and fitting ground and like that. And I thought I was doing pretty good. I was getting a dollar a day, <laughs> when that's when grown men, that's all they were getting for work at that time. Mm -hmm. um, were you raised in like a religious home or like did you attend church every Sunday? Yes, I went to church right here, this white church, congregational church up here. Okay. Then later on, I taught Sunday school up there. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Roselle told me that you worked in Smith's Basin harvesting ice. Yes, uh, Mr. Roselle thought that might be something you hadn't ever heard of. I know, harvesting ice. Well, uh, see, the milk uh, was transported from all the farms. There used to be a lot more farms around here than there are now. Mm -hmm. And the milk was transported in cans over to Smith Basin. There's a big now, do you ever go through Smith Basin, across the railroad tracks? I heard of it, I never got No, there. all right. There's a, <laughs> still a great big building there that was a creamery. Mm -hmm. And the milk was all taken in there. Well, at that time, there was no mechanical refrigeration as you know it today. So we had to uh, refrigerate everything with ice. So the canal runs right along there. Mm -hmm. And up the canal, right next to the locks, they used to cut the ice. They cut it with a, an old Model T Ford motor and a great big 48 inch round circle saw, oh, which, which you probably never saw a saw in wood or anything, but <laughs> that's what they used. And they cut sl slices of the ice uh, two foot uh, wide, mm -hmm. and then they would cross cut them. Mm -hmm. Uh, every three feet. So a cake of ice was two by three by whatever depth it froze to. And uh, long later in the winter, February like that, it would get up to three foot uh, wow. thick. So a cake of ice at that time would weigh probably 300 pounds. Wow. They had a, the, the canal sets a lot lower than above the bank up here and it goes down the canal. Mm -hmm. They had a, a long ramp made of wood with sides on it, narrow side like that, and a walkway up and down it. And they had a winch up on top which one of the farmers would bring his tractor there and run this winch and they had what they called a crab mm -hmm. which was a metal thing shaped, shaped like that with a handle up here. What they would do, they had this ice all scored. Mm -hmm. They would take it and they had it right up to that to that ramp. Mm -hmm. They would take spuds or you were you were doing ice fishing or anything like that? No. I've looked at pictures of like ice well, harvesting. What there is just a big knife. Yeah. About that wide, sharp mm -hmm. on a handle. They take that, go into the scores where they scored the ice, 
and that would split off the cakes in the individual cakes. Yep. They would bring them over to the ramp. Mm -hmm. Then they would take this crab, mm -hmm. and whoever was running the crab, depending on how brave he was, <laughs> he'd take three or four or five cakes, mm -hmm. hook that back of it, then the farmer would start the winch, pulling it up, and he'd have to walk alongside of it to keep it from kicking up. Oh my gosh. Well, some of the guys, he'd go up, then onto a platform up mm -hmm. on top, then all the farmers that brought in milk would have their trucks there. Mm -hmm. That was that was a big thing because that paid good money oh, at yeah. that time. The ice for the milk and everything. And yeah, and they would slide it onto the mm -hmm. trucks. Then they'd transport it over to the ice house. Mm -hmm. And at the ice house, they had a, a the ice house about three stories high. Mm -hmm. They had a big framework that went up. Mm -hmm. And it had a like an elevator. Well, it was slanted like that, made of steel. Mm -hmm. You would <clears throat> a farmer would have a tractor on a winch. Mm -hmm. At that point, they would slide the cake onto when they brought out the truck. Mm -hmm. They'd go onto the elevator, and of course they started down. Oh, we'll say this high. Yeah. So the elevator would just go up. The cake would slide off in the ice house. Well, as they got a layer of ice. Of course, they kept going higher and higher and higher. And uh, they ended up about three stories high. When did you ice harvest? Like, what age were you at? January. It was done in January and February. Oh, okay. So it was only just two months? Yeah. Because of, oh, yeah, because of the ice house can only be. Yeah, that's yeah. when the ice was. Mm. It was uh, normally started in January. And of course, that was good for me because, that, because there was of the a, vaca climbing? a vacation in January. Yeah. From school. Mm -hmm. and, <coughs> I was able to get on the job. That was a uh, privilege to get on that job because oh, yeah? <laughs> if, at that time, it was paying, as I remember, I think it was paying like five dollars an hour. Oh. When the average man was getting a dollar a day. What year was when you started ice harvesting? And uh, <laughs> I was born 26, uh -huh. and I was 16 years old because 16 I 16 years old. I couldn't work on the ice until I had my social security number. Oh, okay. And I couldn't get that until I was 16. Okay. And... So I'd have to figure... 1926, well, that would... What, you were 13 when the war broke out, right? What age were you when World War II first broke out? Well, it's 41. Mm -hmm. Was it 39? But we got into it in 41. It actually broke out in 39. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, like 18? No, I wasn't that old. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that old because I graduated when I was 18. I'd have to do some bearing back. Oh, that's fine. But, uh, well, I was 16 years old and I started working there. Mm -hmm. So 16 and 26 is 16. Can you remember how you felt on December 7, 1941 when Pearl Harbor was first bombed? Yes, we were all. Shock, of course, we've been watching or listening to it. Didn't watch it then, no television, but listening mm -hmm. to everything. When did you first hear it? What's that? When did you first hear it? Like, what were you doing? I don't remember just exactly what I was doing at the mm -hmm. time. I know I was working mm -hmm. someplace when we first, somebody came and told us about it. But uh, I was in school. I was in school. Mm -hmm. when, You're in school. Were we in the, in high school. Yeah, in school, and I first heard about it. Mm -hmm. They announced it over the public address system. Mm -hmm. there was, then everybody, of course, headed for trying to find a radio. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's all you had at that time. Mm -hmm. So. Go to the movies and watch. Yeah, go to the movies, watch movie town news, and you get know, all. That's where you got most of it. So you weren't old enough to join. <coughs> the war when it first broke out? No. Okay. Yeah. Do you no. remember like how life was on the home front during the war? Oh yes. We had everything. We had rationing. Mm -hmm. Of course everything was rationed. Sugar and gasoline. Gasoline. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, tires. tires. Everything. <laughs> oh so, yeah. Like in this area there's a lot of support for the troops. Oh yes. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them. Okay. From, went from here. Oh yeah? Did you have a lot of friends and family that went into the war? Oh yeah. Like... A right. lot of friends. I didn't have any family. Well, I did too. My uncle. I had one uncle as a captain over in China, Burma, India. Mm. He was a, in the veterinary. He was in that. And I had another uncle who was in the Seabees. Mm -hmm. He was over in South Pacific. Oh, yeah. And uh, plus, I had a lot of friends that went in from out of, after they got out of high school. Mm -hmm. We had. Well, they had draft then. They had draft, of course. Well, there's Tommy, <coughs> Bill and Hugh, we had several of them you know, killed mm -hmm. and, uh, overseas. overseas. Mm -hmm. So, and we had, we had scrap drives, you know, you gathered metal, mm -hmm. tires, everything up, up in school there. We, we, uh, we collected over a hundred tons of scrap. We had the whole backyard of school. Full of scrap, we had a snow fence all around it, mm -hmm. like that. But everybody got into that. <coughs> then you had the airplane watch. What they call that? Edna? I, I don't remember. <laughs> uh, volunteers uh, watched 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a, up there. Everybody had different things for airplanes going over. Mm -hmm. You had a call system where you heard or saw a plane, you had to call it in to a certain number. So, because they didn't know, <coughs> pardon me, when, uh, you know, they're going to be attacked. Mm -hmm. Or is there going to be? And so we had that, and that was a 24 hour thing. People volunteered. I, I was in that for years, and uh, usually at night, mm -hmm. cold. It was all the cold. If you were like, if you were the age to have actually joined the war, you would have wanted to have joined the war. Well, when I got to be eighteen, mm -hmm. when I graduated, I uh, joined the Navy V twelve program. Okay. I passed all the tests and everything. Myself, another fellow up here. Uh, that was a program. Heard <coughs> me. Where you went in for two years, you went to, had a chance to go to a, a two-year college to get an education of whatever the Navy wanted. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, but uh, I passed all the tests. Then I went my physical. They rejected me because I wore glasses. Really? Yeah. The other fellow that was with me, Billy Miller, uh, he passed. He went in. And he wore glasses too, but I was nearsighted. He was farsighted. That's what the reason they gave me. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't able to be in. I said, "Well, I might as well go to work when I, after I graduated." So I worked for a year, probably a year, out to Union Bag, out in Hudson Falls. Oh, okay. You probably heard of it. Oh yeah, it it's, was there before the Grand Union. It's, it's gone now. Mm -hmm. it's the building been torn down, down next to the river there. Now you can talk so much. And uh, then I was drafted in September. I go there. Drafted in June or July. June or July of. Mm -hmm. I went in in September. Mm -hmm. In the army. Oh, yeah, into the artillery army, you said? No, just in the regular army. Okay. And where were you stationed? Fort? Fort Hancock, New right. Jersey. Mm -hmm. I joined the New York State Guard while I was still, while I was working. The so New York State Guard was organized uh, because the National Guard had already gone into action. Yeah. So they had the New York State Guard. Mm -hmm. And I joined the National State Guard, and I was a member of that until I was drafted. Okay, so when you turned 18, you wanted to join the war, but they denied you because of your eyesight. Because so you of my joined eyesight. The New York State Guard, and then you were stationed in Fort. Um, and then I went in the Army. Since I already had, I was a corporal in the State Guard, I had most of my basic training. Mm -hmm. So I was transferred right out to. Uh, Fort Dix. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, then since I was a, had worked the hardware store, my parents owned the hardware store. Mm -hmm. I'd worked the hardware store and uh, done a lot of different things like that. Uh, and the fact that I worked for the town of Hartford uh, <coughs> while I was still in high school because all able-bodied men around were in service. Mm -hmm. And so I worked for the town plowing snow uh, during the winter, mm -hmm. the, the trucks and Caterpillar tractor they had. And uh, because it, nobody, you know, very few able bodied men still around. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> I got down to Fort Dix, and they, as I say, since I've been on a hardware store, they say, all right, you're a storekeeper. <laughs> so, I was transferred to Fort Hancock at that time, mm -hmm. and Fort Hancock was originally a few, uh, coast artillery base, yeah. because at one time uh, the German subs had come, you know, right alongside Long Island and uh, yeah. all down through the ocean there, so they had these huge field artillery pieces. Uh, along the coast there. Yep. Right, so I think it was called like during the Battle of the Atlantic. The submarines came really close to our shores. Oh yeah. They actually bombed some beach sides. Yeah, some places. And so that's why they constructed Fort Hancock? Well, no, Fort, Fort Hancock was originally Fort there. Fort Hancock was there, guns, been there yeah. for years. Oh yeah. But it was a coast artillery mm -hmm. base at that time. Well, as I say, towards the end of the war. They started uh, removing the guns, didn't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, they also constructed a uh, prison, prison camp, mm -hmm. and that's where they put a lot of uh, German and Italian prisoners yep. that were brought over sea. I don't know if you're aware of Fort Hancock, where it is. It's in New Jersey, right? Well, it's, it's right out in the ocean. Oh, okay. Uh, just bear with me, but it might <laughs> help you out. Oh, yep, the Sandy Hook. Yep. And Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. There's Fort Hancock right on the end of there. And as you can see, where that comes back to the land, it's very narrow. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there's only, where it came back to the mainland, there's only uh, less than half a mile wide. So I made it ideal for a, a prison camp. Oh, yeah. Because it was so isolated, you might say. And, uh, I was transferred there in the 1225th United States Disability Barracks, USDB. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went in there, there was only, I think, five non commissioned officers. That's non commissioned officers, or sergeants, corporals. Like that, there's one officer and five non commissioned officers. Mm -hmm. So it was wide open to get things done. Pardon me. Mm -hmm. It was quite a quite a place. It was nobody was doing much. The brought a prisoner there. Yeah. <coughs> the Germans and the Italians first came German inside? Italian prisoners. Okay. When they were transferred to Fort Hancock? Your job was to give out clothes, right? To the prisoners? No, not to them. Okay. When I first went out down there, mm -hmm. uh, our first job was to load uh, these prisoners, there's about 500 of them, mm -hmm. load them on the ships to send them back overseas. Okay, so why did they bring them originally to Fort Hancock? Well, they brought a lot of German and Italian prisoners over here. Mm -hmm. They were all, all up and down the coast because they didn't have room for them over here. So they were prisoners of war? <coughs> prisoners of war, okay. yeah. And th at the end of the war they started shipping them back? They started shipping them back. Okay. Yeah, a lot of them didn't want to go. They had girlfriends over here <laughs> like that. But uh, they were shipped back. And uh, 
uh, at this time I was uh, what they call company clerk mm -hmm. or supply clerk in the supply room, that was, which was very small at that time. Then they started bringing American prisoners over mm -hmm. from ETO, Europe, European Theater. Okay. High point. See, they got points for how many years they've been there and how many battles they were in overseas. Mm -hmm. And even though they were prisoners, they still had their points. And uh, these were mostly, the biggest share of them were black market. Mm -hmm. There was murder, rape, any kind of a... So that's the kind of crimes that... A crime that, that, crime that yeah. you could think of. So those are the kind of crimes that earned their position in Fort Hancock? They were brought back here. All of them had life sentences. Oh, really? During the war. Mm -hmm. During the war, all the sentences handed out were life. There were four different kinds of life sentences, which I didn't know until I got down there. But, mm -hmm. And all of them had life sentences. So they would bring them over and into this compound, which was a bunch of wooden, wooden buildings, uh, barracks, and all surrounded by a double, double wide fence, 10 feet high. It was, barbed wire on top of it and everything. Mm -hmm. And there was a jeep path around it, so there was guards going around jeeps all the time, guarding it. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a total, I was told, there was a total of about 45,000 GI prisoners. And they, <coughs> and they ranged everywhere from private stuff. We had one lieutenant colonel in the Air Force there. He, he, and they sold everything over there after the war. This is the end of the war. They were selling everything. They even sold a Liberty ship over in France. You know what a Liberty ship is? Mm -hmm. right, they even sold one of those to a bunch over in France. Mm -hmm. And they were, of course, the people over there didn't have much of anything. It all been destroyed during the war. So the Americans had all sorts of food and everything you think of it. That's where the black market yep. came up. Were people, you said that the prisoners in Fort Hancock were there because of like rape and murder? Everything. Right? And but also because they sold items on the black market? Black market. And that was the biggest share. Okay. The black market? The black market was probably two thirds. All right. When they got over here, mm -hmm. every one of them was given a, a new trial. A new trial? Oh, so they had a trial in Europe? Oh, yeah, they were tried by a military tribunal okay. over in Europe mm -hmm. during war time. Well, then he got over here. Every one of them was given a new trial, mm -hmm. and all their sentences were reduced oh, yeah. way down to from a life sentence to five years, ten years. Yeah, because they even earned a life trial when they were selling items on the black market over in Europe. They were still given a life sentence. Yes. Because it's wartime, okay. and uh, when they're brought over here, they were given retrials, mm -hmm. and then uh, well, during this time, uh, I was a company clerk, a supply clerk. Mm -hmm. Then I got promoted to a regimental supply sergeant, and mm -hmm. that's when I got my three stripes. <laughs> I was supposed to be a, a tech sergeant which is two rank, ranks higher, but since that's my first promotion, I was given a buck sergeant. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were 1,500 people, guards, that were in the United States Disciplinary Barracks, 1225th. And I had all the food, clothing, ammunition, mm -hmm. uh, Transportation, everything was under me, and here I was, 19 and a half years old. <laughs> it was quite a, quite a thing. I had, there was a lot of, there was four civilian workers that were hired that did most of the paperwork and like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after uh, they were, get back, I had a. I tried to all those warehouses. I had four warehouses, and 
we had to furnish all the food and everything for the prisoners mm -hmm. and the clothing. In fact, uh, <coughs> one trip uh, out of, I think, in the company that uh, that I was in, I think that uh, I think there was only eight or ten people from north of Mason Dixon Williams. All the rest of them were Southerners. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had to have a bunch of clothing which was being processed at Pine Camp. Well, Pine Camp is now Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. Up in the Adirondacks. Okay. You're aware of Fort Drum? Yeah. All right. That was Pine Camp at that time. Okay. Since I'm the only one from up the north, northern area, mm -hmm. I was set, put in charge of a convoy of eight trucks to go to Pine Camp and pick up all this clothing for the prisoners. Mm -hmm. What the clothing was, it was just uh, khakis, mm -hmm. shirts and pants and so forth that were dyed brown, okay. lousy brown. <laughs> but that's what the clothing was, so I had to take this convoy of trucks from New Jersey mm -hmm. up to Fort Hancock, New York. Mm -hmm. We loaded all the clothing and brought it back. Uh, you mean up to Fort Drum, New York? Fort Drum, New York. Okay, and you took all the clothes from there and you brought it back to Fort Hancock? To for Fort the Hancock. For the prisoners? For the prisoners. Okay, so you're in charge of the clothing, transportation, and ammunition, you said? And food. Yeah, what about ammunition and weapons? Mm -hmm. When they were sent over, the prisoners were sent over, mm -hmm. they took high point men that were ready to come back home. Yeah. And <clears throat> put them as guards of all these prisoners. And when they got over here, they were all armed with pistols, carbines, mainly some machine guns, mm -hmm. oh, uh, machine guns. Uh, rising burp guns they call them, mm -hmm. and Thompson submachine guns. <coughs> and, you, <coughs> Pardon me. Oh, and you gave them... When they yeah. got over here, they had to turn that all in. Yeah before they didn't get discharged. So I was, here I had all this ammunition and weapons and everything, and I had to give them a receipt for everything they turned in. And if that didn't correspond with the receipt they were given when they were shipped over, they couldn't get discharged. So they made sure that they had everything because they wanted to get out. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had, I'm Fort Drum, Happened to be there was a place, an armory, which was an area that had, you know what a Quonset hut is? Mm -hmm. It's a half round steel building. Okay. You see them around now, garages like that made of steel. Mm -hmm. But that's what was the standard building for the military, the Quonset hut. Okay. And they'd be all 20 foot wide by anywhere up to. 50, 100, 200 feet long. And then there was also uh, concrete bunkers where we kept all the ammunition. So you, the ammunition that you got from the guards right. at Fort Hancock, you transported to Fort Drum and, no, the, and no. the arsenal? No, the only time it went to Fort Drum was for clothing. Oh, for clothing? Okay. Yeah. This stuff was all kept right there at Fort Hancock. Okay. And well, I had to inventory all that stuff. Mm -hmm. When you've got a pile of 45 caliber ammunition, which is yeah. about that long, that would fill this. Yeah, it takes you a while. And that was, it's like that, you've got to count it, mm -hmm. every one of them. Mr. Rosell said that you had some anecdotes that you remembered from Fort Hancock? <laughs> yes. Okay. I was sitting on the, sitting on the dock with another friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And when there was a big explosion at Perth Amboy, mm -hmm. which was a big uh, munitions depot where they brought in all the ships and unloaded mines and such as that, and they had a tremendous explosion at that time. Mm -hmm. And we, we saw the, you know, the flash and everything. Well, Perth Amboy, if you look at the map, is directly across from uh, Sandy Hook. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
probably I'm guessing five miles. We saw this all the smoke going up, this huge flash. Well it takes you know sound travels slower than eyesight. Mm -hmm. So we saw it and then seemed like minutes afterwards. You heard it? We heard it and felt it. In fact it rolled the three of us sitting there, with our feet over the hanging over the dock. It rolled us right backwards. The huh. concussion from five miles away. But that was probably the most thing that I remember from down there. Mm -hmm. When these uh, prisoners were all, uh, after they'd been through their final trials, you asked about counseling when you were talking to me. There wasn't any such thing as that back then. Mm -hmm. You know, they were brought over, retried, then shipped out. And <clears throat> they were shipped to federal penitentiaries. And I had to prepare all the food and clothing and everything for all these trips. And a, a prison train came in and uh, loaded up the main prisoners ready to go mm -hmm. and took off. Well, go to Atlanta, Georgia, one federal, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, mm -hmm. and I forget some of the other, but it ended up in Alcatraz. Really? Alcatraz? Oh yeah. And uh, because they were distributed, depending on where they were from, mm -hmm. they were distributed to their area. Do you remember any like certain prisoners that stuck out in your mind? Yes, this, this lieutenant colonel of uh, the Air Force. Mm -hmm. And of course, in the Air Force, they made rank real young. Oh, yeah. Then, uh, no lieutenant colonel would probably be going in his 40s or 50s, something like that, you know, for your army. There they made it when they are late 20s, early 30s. Well, I was talking to him. He was he was sent on a work party. They used to send work parties up to me when we were counting this ammunition and everything like that. And he was one of the ones that sent on that work party. And I got talking to him and uh, he was telling me he had 27 missions 27 over, missions. over Germany. Wow. And, uh, but he apparently sold a tremendous amount of stuff. To the he, Germans? No. Well, to French mainly. Okay. You know, the black market. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me, he said, well, he said, I'm probably going to get five or six years, mm -hmm. or maybe even more, he says, sentence when they, but he says, uh, I guess I can stand that. He says, I got about $100,000 stashed away in some banks, so when I get out, he <laughs> says, uh, I'll have that. He says, I won't be that old. But, he, but there was, I remember one, one guy, <laughs> some I remember they sent, would send me up prisoners that came in to get new clothing. Mm -hmm. Well, they sent me up this one guy. He was a Negro fellow, mm -hmm. and he was about I remember about six foot six tall. And now he he took a size eighteen collar. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have that big, and I had extra large clothing. Mm -hmm. And it would just barely fit him. Oh, he was, you know, talking about muscles. I'm telling you, he had muscles <laughs> then some. But we finally, and his shoes were size 14. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any of those. I had to order those. I had to order special clothing, mm -hmm. or shirts and so forth, for him particularly. And you first dealt with German and Italian soldiers and then Americans? Yeah. Was there any like different like feelings for the German Germans compared with the American prisoners of war? Well, the German prisoners. <laughs> yeah, Germans, Italians. Just the job you were shipping them back over. Uh -huh. You felt sorry for a lot of these Americans mm -hmm. because a lot of them, well, a lot of them would, would escape. You know, they'd get out of there somehow. They'd escape Fort Hancock. Fort Hancock. What happened to them once they escaped? They were caught. Mm -hmm. Because the biggest sheriff lived in New York City. Mm -hmm. Well, straight across where we went across on a ferry, mm -hmm. we went to the battery. Mm 
Battery Park. And that was only eight, nine miles, something like that. Where you went around to get to New York City is a hundred miles. Yeah, and so because went, of the space they're obviously cut up. Those guys, they said it happened so many times they'd have their get their addresses or their home address was. Okay. The time they got there would be MPs mm -hmm. waiting there to pick them up. Was it easy to escape Fort Hancock or no. was it just the prisoners themselves? It, okay. it was just the prisoners, some of them managed a way of getting out of there. Okay. And your later years while working at Fort Hancock, what was that like? Because you said that after Fort Hancock you started, you went into the construction battalion? Well, 20 years later. 20 years later. And that was in the 70s you went into? 69. Okay. I, <clears throat> I was only there at Fort Hancock for a year and some days. Mm -hmm. I was, before I went in, I got married. <laughs> Before I went in the army, mm -hmm. and eh, it lasted pretty good. Oh yeah, and after Fort Hancock, what did you do? Sixty-five years, is that not? <laughs> yeah, we yeah. yeah. were married sixty-five years. <laughs> and, uh, after Fort Hancock, what did you do? Well, I came home, went to work uh -huh. for the hardware store, had the hardware. Okay. Why did you go into the construction battalion when you did? Well, it was right. See, they had electrical, plumbing, everything in it. Constructive mm -hmm. battalion. Yeah, you're perfect for it. And uh, I was an electrician. Mm -hmm. And a fella that lived across the uh, road from us up there that ran the uh, general store mm -hmm. in Hartford, which isn't there anymore, was in the CBs. And he taught me into going into the CBs. Okay, where were you deployed in during the CBs? Well, we were deployed to Port Wani, or not Port Wani, uh, Camp of June. Okay. See, we trained, CBs trained with the Marines uh -huh. every two years. Every two. Every, every year the CBs reserve, that is all reserve, go on two, to, two weeks or better active duty. And uh, we were shipped. We went to Gulfport, mm -hmm. Mississippi, Camp Lejeune, Paris Island. We worked on a big, huge Boy Scout camp down in Virginia. And, uh, and of course, I, was, I went down to uh, Gitmo, Guantanamo. Oh, you went down to Guantanamo Bay? Gitmo, yeah. Oh, okay. I was down there for two and a half weeks. And then, uh, also went to uh, Rota, Spain. We were over there. This was and it's all construction work. And you went in for the Navy. And you went in, in 1969. No, I went in, joined the CB okay. in '69. And then you trained. I was in for 23 years. Oh, okay. And during different deployments, mm -hmm. why we went okay. to various ports <laughs> on the eastern coast, and then they say I was lucky enough to get. Chosen to head a detachment, air detachment down to Gitmo, okay. and also went over and rode to Spain. Head of air detachment? What does that entail? Uh, an air detachment is a CB unit mm -hmm. which consists of approximately 50 to 60 men okay. of all trades builders, plumbers, mm -hmm. electricians, uh, surveyors. Mm -hmm. And you were an electrician? I was an electrician chief, okay. and uh, they were set up, and they were set to be mobilized on uh, 48 hours notice, and sent out by air. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason they're known as air detachments. Because you're in charge of their deployment in 48 hours? Yeah. Okay. And uh, well, we had most of the things we did around here. Mm -hmm were what they call goodwill projects. See, we trained one weekend a month, plus two weeks active duty. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, oh, hundreds of goodwill projects around in this area. Fort Edward, we built a Fort Edward firehouse, not the new one, they have the two bay, or even Fort Edward, 
Mm -hmm. So you're in charge of a lot of Saturday holes. local construction? Yeah. You, during the CDs, you're in charge of local right, construction? Right, during, the, yeah, we had these constructed projects. Oh, okay. And uh, we built playgrounds for schools. Really? I think about every school around. And other countries, what kind of thing were you building? You said you worked for the Navy, was that it? It's construction. Uh-huh. Construction, we were building buildings and, uh, well, one of them we were doing airport work hmm. and uh, down in Gitmo we were building housing for regular, uh, you know, the regular Navy people. Okay. So um, it mm -hmm. was all naval construction. Mr. Ozell told me to mention Mr. Paper. What's that? Mr. Paper, he says. Paper? Yep. Yeah, Henry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, uh, what, Matt told me, she is secretary? Yep. Out there? Mm-hmm. I'm telling you what her name was now. Mrs. Murray? Or something. Yeah, Henry Piper was uh, <coughs> in the Seabees with me. And mm -hmm. uh, I went on several training duties with him. Very mm -hmm. nice man. Really? Oh, very nice. <laughs> My wife met him. And he was a great guy. He was, he was a surveyor, estimator for her. Uh, Adirondack construction. That was what he worked at regularly, but he was using the CV for a good many years. Um, how did you transition from working as a CV to your return home? Because you said you worked there for 29 years. How did you make the decision to... Well, it was, it's, as far as the transition, it wasn't as you were, you drill one weekend a month mm. and uh, you're gone for Two to two and a half week a uh, year, mm -hmm. so there was no great transition. We drilled uh, several several of our uh, deployments were up at Fort Drum. Oh, okay, so locally. Because we were uh, since we were a northern battalion, mm -hmm. we were considered a cold weather battalion, so we had to train yeah. in cold weather. Okay, so like the when you did construction projects at other countries, those were kind of rare. For you to come across? Well, uh, there were battalions, there's like 23 battalions, uh -huh. reserve battalions in the country. Uh -huh. And some battalions are going overseas every year. Yeah. The ones on the west coast go to Guam, uh, Hawaii, different islands like that. Uh, and the ones on the east coast mainly go to. Uh, Oh, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. uh, Gitmo, yeah. Spain. So by location, yeah. if they needed you, they would call you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think I'm done with that part of my question, although I do want to ask you just a few more questions about World War II, yeah. just so I understand your like feelings about it. Um, what were your feelings when FDR died in April 1945, near the end of the war? Very, very sad because he had been a huge influence, you know, on the on the war. Mm -hmm. I had meetings with Chamberlain and uh, Russia, like that. Mm -hmm. He was uh, a big influence. And, uh, so you're impressed by him? Very his much. His actions in the war? Very much. Okay. Um, do you support Truman's decision to use the atomic bomb in Japan? Yes. You do? Yes. Okay. Was that like a sentiment shared around this area? Pretty much so, because there were so many young men being killed mm -hmm. in this island hopping, mm -hmm. uh, you know, going from island to island to get to Japan, mm -hmm. that they knew that uh, when they actually got them attacked Japan, mm -hmm. that it was going to be a bloodbath. So you were aware that like some of the islands didn't necessarily have to be taken? Yes. Okay. And you were aware of that during the war? No, you weren't aware of that during the war. Mm -hmm. You found out about it afterwards. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> maybe some bad decisions made, but... Mm -hmm. But, uh... I, say, <clears throat> I, I had one uncle in the sea, he, he was over in the South Pacific. Okay. And, uh, Green Island. And, uh, <coughs> he was in Hudson Falls. Do you remember when Truman made this, like, decision? Well, uh, we didn't know about it until after it happened. Uh -huh. You know, 
it wasn't told that before the yeah, I, it was a secret. bomb drop. Yeah. But, uh, no, I think it was a horrific thing and all that, but uh, it was it certainly saved a good many thousand mm -hmm. American lives. Were you surprised by it at all? What's that? Were you surprised by it at all? We'd heard rumors that they had this because of the tests out in Nevada. Mm -hmm. You know, the atom bomb tests out in Nevada. Mm -hmm. And we knew that, had heard rumors about that they had such a weapon. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't all that much of a surprise when, when they used it. Okay. So overall, what are your thoughts on World War II? It was a it was a war that was supported by everybody in the United States. Mm -hmm. It had a purpose, mm -hmm. you know. And so many of the conflicts they've had since that, you wonder about. Yeah. Vietnam, for one, mm -hmm. and uh, even the last two, Afghanistan and, and Iraq. You wonder mm -hmm. what are what is the United States getting out? You know, for all the all the people that are getting killed, maimed, and everything, mm -hmm. losing legs. Yeah. But World War II, you had a you had a known enemy that you had to defeat. And I think that's why a lot of the citizens were willing to make sacrifices. Yeah. Because you said that, um, like during your life in the war, like the depression and everything and the rations, you made a lot of sacrifices. Well, you got along with a lot of things, you, mm -hmm. without a lot of things, but you learned uh, to make do. And uh, you just <coughs> got by with what you had. And that, that was the way during, well, when my wife and I were first married, uh, I was getting, what, $25 a week, isn't it? 25 for years. Yeah, for years. We got twenty-five. Lived on twenty-five dollars a week. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I get. We used to sell Christmas trees. We did a lot of things. Wife sold produce. We had a big garden out back here. We had a gas pump. Yeah, we had gas pumps up front here. <laughs> My grandparents had them, mm -hmm. so we had gas pump for about twenty years. Tight, tight all gas. Mm -hmm. You don't even hear that anymore. <laughs> My yeah. wife pumped gas for 20 years. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, that picture up there is a picture of the pumps that were out here. Okay. And I used to, after I got on, I worked for the hardware eight hours a day, mm -hmm. sometimes more. I'd, so you, I'd, uh, yeah, you've been get, used to the I'd get, I'd get a job, some farmers pitching hay. Mm -hmm. Pitching bale hay and so forth. A lot of side jobs. Sure. Because yep. that's what you needed to get by. Every little bit helped. Yeah. All right. I yep. think I think we're done with the interview now. Okay. Thank you for letting us tape you and everything. Yep. We bought Christmas trees from over Orangeburg <laughs> and, and uh, right. West Fort Ann, different place like that. Oh yeah. And we sold them out here. Alright, thank you so much. I think I got everything. Well, to say, <laughs> my, my purpose, or my part in the war wasn't anything, that, anything, or the actual ones or anything like that. Mm -hmm. but I know I, <clears throat> I talked to Matt, Mr. Roselle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm 